Hi, Filmatics. Welcome to the show. Today, we have an amazing and very, very special guest. We have Arturo Art Hernandez, and he is the director and di directing currently The Cat in the Hat, and he is known for Atlantis, The Lost Empire, Hercules, and Beauty and the Beast. Let's welcome Art to the show. Hi, Art. Hi, Marilyn. Thanks for having me. This is an honor. It's nice to be part of the Filmatics family. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, this is just such a special treat for us today. And we are recording, of all things, on Easter, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so happy spring, happy Great Easter, holiday. happy Passover, happy whatever you celebrate, right? <laughs> and um, so where are you recording with me live today? We're pre-recording it, but where are you um, in the world? Because our listeners are all around the world from, you know, Ukraine sure. to uh, Italy to China to just USA, Canada, Australia. So thank you for listening. And so where are you today? I am in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. Like, like literally the heart of downtown Los Angeles. It's the closest to any kind of like New York City kind of life you can have. So my wife and I have a loft downtown. Oh. So, and it's, it's, it's a nice central location, all the different studios. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. And I get to see your pinball machine. So I will have to talk about your pinball plane. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, so Arturo, I'm going to ask you, so, uh, you know, can you share with us a little bit, like, um, where are you from? So I was born and raised in Los Angeles. I'm one of those, you know, there aren't too many of us that work in animation that are actually from L.A. So I got really lucky. You know, it's basically my backyard. But um, so, yeah, I grew up here. And it's funny, though, because even though I grew up in L.A. and had, you know, access potentially to Disney and all these other places, places you know I, I grew up at a time when you know there was no internet so i could date myself um and so getting to getting to figure out exactly how to get into animation wasn't exactly the easiest thing in the world but uh but it, it did make things easier being here in la oh yeah. yeah and um and you have something um very special that you're uh is it uh, correct you are the first generation mexican american right I am. I'm a first generation Mexican American. Uh, my dad was born and raised in Mexico. Um, so on my dad's side, I'm the first generation. My mom was born and raised here, but her parents are from Mexico. Oh. Um, and it's funny because uh, both sides of the family, the my dad's hometown and my mom's family's hometown are basically right next to each other in the highlands of Jalisco. So, uh, so we have deep roots there. I still have lots of family there. Um, I'm very proud of, of my culture and my heritage. It, it, it's, uh, it's deeply infused in a lot of the stories that, that uh, my personal stories that I have, my projects. And, you know, a lot of that storytelling also comes into just the stories and things that uh, that I'm working on. And even in the storyboards that I work on, a lot of that would uh, would find its way in. You know, my uh, my maternal grandmother was was a huge storyteller. Like I, I get I get my love of storytelling from her. Um, and she was also my biggest champion. Yeah, you know, nobody, nobody was was a bigger supporter of you know my artwork and just my passion for for filmmaking and animation than my grandmother. So I deeply miss her, but uh, but she was a huge influence. Oh, so can you tell me you so you started drawing at an early age, right? I did, I did for as long as I can remember. Um, shoot, I, I guess the, my earliest memories of it would have been like kindergarten around that age. Um, I got in trouble for it a lot in school <laughs> because it was one of those, you know, learning, learning when was the right time to draw. Uh, I, I do remember getting in trouble in fourth grade and, uh, I, if I remember correctly, my teacher was Mr. Young and, and I got very lucky because Mr. Young, I found out many years later was, uh, was an art major in school. And so rather than uh, rather than send me to the principal's office he called for a parent teacher conference and sat down with my folks and he said look you know he's got a talent you know it should be nurtured we just need to let him know that he shouldn't be drawing on the back of his CompuCat tests <laughs> so <laughs> which, which i was much 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 more happy to do than uh than sitting down and doing math i suck at math i still do uh thank god for calculators um, <laughs> But uh, but it was thanks to 
to Mr. Young that my folks, you know, saw that this was something that uh, that was important to me. And it was just a matter of, uh, of making sure that I, you know, would do it at the right time, right place. Um, so, yeah, for as long as I can remember, that was the case. And, you know, shoot, I even remember uh, being at my grandmother's. They lived in Venice, California. And uh, same grandma, my grandma Peggy. And uh, when we would spend weekends there, because my dad, uh, my dad worked really long hours, worked a lot of overtime. And, uh, and I remember we would spend a lot of weekends there and where my siblings, I'm the eldest of four, my siblings would, would go sack out in one of the back rooms or whatever. I was allowed to be the eldest to choose where I wanted to sack out for the night for the weekend. So I would sleep on the couch in the living room and I loved it because it was just, it was my little spot and I would draw at night I, with a flashlight under the covers. And I could hear my mom and my grandmother in the kitchen, just, you know, the gossiping, the things that happen, especially around kitchens and Mexican American families. And I could hear my mom ask, you know, you think he's asleep? And I could see my grandmother poke her head over the ledge. <laughs> she knew I wasn't asleep. And yet she would say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's fast asleep. He's it's lights out for him. So she covered for me in a big way for them. But, but yeah, I mean, for as long as I can remember, this is all I ever wanted to do was draw. And what were you drawing? Like, uh, were you drawing like animals, people, houses, cars? A little bit of everything. A little bit of everything. Animals, people, uh, little caricatures. Uh, again, it was always something that I wanted to do, which is interesting too, because it, it, especially with, uh, again, with animation and, you know, not having the advent of, of the internet and being able to Google, how do you become an animator? You know, I, I was a little lost up until maybe, uh, you know, late years of high school. And, uh, and even then it, it was all about just guidance and running into the right people at the right time. But, uh, but drawing was, was something again, that I always, you know, always, always wanted to do. And, uh, and so coming out of high school, you know, again, being the eldest in, uh, in a working class family, going to an expensive art school, a fancy art school just was not going to be an option, especially a place like CalArts. And, uh, and so I did what a lot of kids do. I went to junior college in the Antelope Valley at that point uh, around my sophomore year of high school my parents moved from LA to Palmdale to the high desert and it was I hated it it was a god awful move I didn't know anybody because I, I grew up around all of these kids you know we all came up together through elementary school and junior high school first couple of years of high school and so leaving behind all of my friends many of whom had the same kind of aspirations was really difficult and uh, so coming out of high school, didn't really know exactly how to get an animation. So I figured, well, I'll just take some illustration courses. And, uh, and it was then that, uh, one of those teachers, uh, Frank Dixon, who's still teaching, uh, he had an illustration course that I was taking. And one of the assignments was to take an illustrator's work, someone that we really admired, you know, and to try to mimic that work using the same kind of medium that that person would use and we could choose someone that was either dead or alive Maurice Sendak or whoever well being a huge Disney geek I immediately went to the Disney press books and there were several that were that were uh, illustrated by a wonderful man named Ron Diaz who has since passed away and uh, and I took a shot I figured well I'll try to get a hold of him and so I got the main line number for uh, for Disney kept getting the runaround you know asking for Ron Diaz and so like the sneaky jerk that I was back then, I called and, and waited for someone new to answer the phone. Yes. Line, and, <laughs> and I told, I told them that I was with the LA Times and I was, I was I needed to do some fact checking and a follow up on a, an article that I was writing on Ron Diaz and I needed to get a hold of him quickly. And they patched me through. Oh my and gosh. So, so that's what I did. And I left him a message. I told him who I was. I said, look, I'm just this college student. I would love to interview you. I would love to talk to you about what you do and being just the amazingly gracious person that he was, he called me right away and he's like, you want to interview me? And I said, yes, please. So he invited me down to the main lot. And, uh, and so I went down and I got to walk around the whole place with him. And I just, every ounce of passion that I have for animation was just that much more increased by being there with him. And, he was the one that said, he's like, look, he's like, sure, you don't need CalArts. You don't need all of these other schools. He's like, you need a good portfolio. And he said, and the reality is, is that there are these classes that are being taught 
by the union over the American Animation Institute, same union that I now belong to, the Animation Guild. And he's like, and he told me, he said, you don't have to be a union member. You just have to be a high school graduate. They're not the easiest classes to get into because you got to call right away. You got to try to squeeze in there. And I got lucky and I did. And I did 12 weeks of figure drawing with Glenn Vilpu, who many of us know in the industry. Oh, wow. Uh, Just a phenomenal uh, figure drawing teacher. And he still teaches. And, uh, And I did 12 weeks of just constant figure drawing. I think I was there twice a week. And then I did, uh, with that, I was also taking an assistant animation course with, um, with, oh gosh, was Alex, uh, oh, why does his name escape me right now? Anyway, Alex. Uh, and after those 12 weeks, I put together what I then figured out was what an animation portfolio needed to look like. And it was chock full of figure drawing and animal drawings, whatever, whenever I wasn't at these classes in North Hollywood, I was at the LA zoo. Now, mind you, I was driving from Palmdale to these classes or to the LA zoo constantly just do that stuff back and forth. Oh, that's brutal. That's determination. Oh, it was. It was an awful drive. Did you have air conditioning? Did you have air conditioning or good music? (laughs) Yeah, just air conditioning and good music. And and that was, that was my life for 12 weeks and and they went by fast and I so I finally had a really good portfolio that I was comfortable with dropped it off all over the place and uh two weeks later I got a call from Turner Feature Animation oh my god and they said hey we've got this movie cats don't dance it's uh it's you know we need a cleanup artist which was entry level for traditional animation and you would come in as an in-betweener but we need you to come down and take a test I said I'm there so I went down, I took a test, and within a few days, I got a call asking if I wanted a job. Ah. And I I just remember my legs turning to jello. I, I nearly passed out. And I think one of my favorite stories, I guess, for me, just, you know, the different events in my life, the miles, milestones for my career, was the day that I went down to sign my contract. Now, at the time, this was like, this is, you know, still on the big, like, heyday of animation. It was, it was the, the uh, return of 2D animation. And I didn't realize that I could have negotiated. <laughs> I just, I went into the office, they showed me the contract, and I, I saw how much they were going to pay me, and I asked, where's your pen? <laughs> and I signed right away. I signed right away. My dad, uh, my dad and I drove down together that day because my dad at the time was working for Forest Lawn. He was a building painter for 35 years, you know, working class dad. And, uh, and he said, look, he's like, why don't, uh, why don't we drive down together? It's a long drive. You can drop me off over in Glendale where the hub is for Forest Lawn. And, uh, and you go off, you do what you need to do. So after I signed the contract, I went over, I picked him up and we were driving home together. And my dad said, so, how'd it go? I said, great. I start on Monday. I said, I even have the contract. So, uh, so I showed it to him. I was driving because he had had a long day that way he could rest. And he's flipping through the pages and it's a typical contract. It's all legalese, but he got to the compensation part of the contract and he had this nervous giggle and it's a giggle that, that I didn't really hear that often. And so I knew something was up and I asked him, I said, what's up? And he said, it took me 23 years to make what you're starting at. And so it was at that moment that I realized that my dad was truly proud of me. Because oh. for a while, it took a lot of convincing, which is really typical, I think, for any family, you know, that, that has an aspiring artist. It's even more difficult when you come from a very Mexican Catholic family where your parents don't want you to be a starving artist, right? And so uh, so that was when I think he realized that I was going to be okay. And now 28 years later, you know, I'm doing fine. I don't think I've ever had a break in employment. It's been just in uh, a constant, just, you know, one step after another, I've been very, very fortunate. And a lot of that has to do with the people that I've worked with. Oh my gosh. I have like chills just listening to that. I mean, you're, that your dad <laughs> is so proud of you and it, and you're making the money that it took him 23 years and you no longer have to be this starving artist i'm still in the starving artist i'm still there and I, i've hit those numbers so hopefully <laughs> hopefully something good will be happening soon 
Um, it will. It yeah, will. yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. confident of that. Yeah, yeah. I'm but, uh, that. but I, I want to ask you. So, uh, can I just ask you real quick? Because you said your beloved, sure. your beloved, our, 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 our. How do you say the name? Our. My abuelita. Oh yeah, Abolita. I like how you say Abolita. Yes. So that's your aunt Abolita. That's the one who nurtured you and 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 knew that you were drawing at night underneath the um the tent and the flashlight, right? Yeah. Oh wow. So yeah. So can I ask you? Did y'all watch films growing up or TV shows? Did you have favorite shows? Did you draw any of those characters when you're younger? We did a lot of that. You know, it's funny though because. I, I wish I could say that a lot of the influence was Disney, but growing up, you know, especially in the, in the 70s and early 80s, Disney animation had a real downturn. So there wasn't a lot out there. You know, and, and, and even earlier on, it's not like we, you know, we still didn't have VHS, so we couldn't really rent that stuff until later. But I would say that my bigger influences were live action, you know, and, and, and hands down, I mean, my generation, it was Spielberg, you know. <laughs> year after year after year or, or george lucas but but easily spielberg and, and those i think were my biggest influences in, in storytelling across the board and I, I would have to say that you know if i had to pick just one movie even though there are many you know i i would have to say it's et ah, and it, it's yeah. it's for lots of reasons it was and i know that people you know there are some film critics out there that would kind of poo poo that movie or you know spielberg's movies in general thinking that they're too commercial or whatever but not for me for, for me they were my childhood for me they were they were the biggest influences and they still hold true and for for me it was it was knowing that i was elliot's age when i saw it in the theater it's the one movie and i'm I, i'm pretty sure that i had seen other movies in the theater prior to that i just don't remember them this one i remember and and it was because i was elliot's age I was, you know, eight going on nine and, and, you know, that, you know, to that wish fulfillment, right. Of being there in the audience and, and wishing I could be him, you know, and what I would do if I had, you know, found an alien as a friend and brought him inside. And, and that still sticks with me. It still sticks with me. It, it um, you know, the idea also, you know, looking back on it now that, that everything in that movie, you know, up to a certain point is all from Elliot or E.T.'s height, from their vantage point. It's always a low camera. You don't see an adult other than mom until the adults have a really active part in changing the relationship between Elliot and E.T. You know, and it, it's so impactful, I think, because of that. And the kids are still, they, you know, they, they ring true. They are authentic. And it's it's funny because like i was saying that oftentimes you know not only my grandmother's stories but but the movies that influenced me still find their way into different scenes that i that that, that i work on or, or storyboards that i've worked on you know I, I would have to say that one of the one of the sequences that i still am very very proud of is is from one of the tinkerbell movies which i think it was the third tinkerbell movie which was uh tinkerbell fire and red not fire rescue sorry that was another tinkerbell uh and the great rescue i think is what it was and the story revolves around this little girl who uh who captures tink and she's a huge fan of fairies she's got them all over her bedroom and she manages to catch tink and they can't communicate with each other because tink you know to human ears just sounds like little bells and lizzie is the little girl's name and i got to storyboard that whole section when Lizzie proudly brings Tink into her bedroom in a cage, in a, in, a, in a bird cage, and lets her out and shows her all of the different things in her bedroom. And I tapped into that whole moment with Elliot in the bedroom with E.T. showing E.T. all of his toys. So, you know, those, those things still have, have a huge impact in, in everything that I do and everything that all the stories that I tell. Oh, my God, that's so incredible. So you're you're watching ET and then you're actually storyboarding an ET like scene in um the Tinkerbell movie. That is so cute. I mean, it's just I I was like up to is it Goonies or ET? Goonies or ET? I was like, hmm, you know, it's 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 it, they're all toss up Spielberg movies, right? <laughs> So we might have a little internet um, Wi-Fi, so hopefully we're coming back. But I'm talking with Art Hernandez, who is uh, the direct. He's directing Cat in the Hat, 
and um, he's got so many fabulous credits. Hopefully, um, our internet will come on back. Let's just see if it's coming on back. And um, we're having a fabulous conversation with Art Arturo. And also, um, you, uh, he's co-producer of My Little Pony, which I can't, I'm can't. i excited to find out um, more on that. So we have Arturo back. Hi, Art, you back? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I just talked while um, the the what the internet. I just recapped a little bit, and uh, okay. yeah, yeah. So the, our audience kinds of knows that we inter we're, we're by the mercy of internet. You know what I mean? Absolutely. <laughs> oh, I know that well. Yeah, <laughs> and it's like if life could only get better, like we have COVID, and it just never will go away, and then like something new, and we're just you know there's we're just just thankful for every day that we have happiness and joy and just doing the things that we love. Yeah. Oh, I agree. So, but I agree. I, yeah, I asked you like, um, uh, did you cry at all when you were watching ET? Did you? Did it? Did it? Oh yeah. <laughs> I was oh, like, yeah. did you do the shoulder thing where you you pretended like you weren't crying, didn't want anyone to see? <laughs> you wiped your eyes. Oh no, I think I think I cried on a bass with Lee. Yeah, it's funny because I just recently watched an interview with John Oliver, and apparently that was a big influence on him as well, and he remembers being carried out by his parents he's just a few years younger than me so he was carried out by his parents and he was in tears because he could not figure out why elliot did not get on that ship with him with et so yeah no it uh it like i said it was it was all et all the time when i was at at that age so yeah, yeah yeah and i was like it was like do i like goonies more or et or gremlins and i'm like i like them all it's really hard to choose but you know it's like i, I i'm I, i'll just yeah, those are my favorites. I actually wrote a script that um is kind of like an ET meets Home Alone of all things, and it's an alien. And um, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that like you were like, I'm not Spielberg, but you know, he's the master. But there might be different versions of people wishing that they can like make it fortuitous. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's what's so great about about you know stories like that is that it, it's it's wish fulfillment no matter what. You know, it's it's why so many of those stories still resonate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then so so that's one of your favorite films. And um, did you did, was that like you were going to the movie theaters? Did you go to the movie theaters with the grandma and your mom and and your brothers? You said you're the eldest of four siblings with their boys and girls. Yep. Yeah. 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 Uh, my sister Lily, she's second, and then my two younger brothers, Raúl and Alberto, oh. and uh, we're all very close in age. My sister especially, we're almost Irish twins. Uh, we're only thirteen months apart. And, uh, and yeah, we would go to the theater. I remember it was the Rainbow Theater in Sunland Tahunga. Oh. And it was about a block and a half from home, so we got to walk there. It was easy. Um, it's no longer there, unfortunately. But you can see it, actually, in the background of Teen Wolf, <laughs> it was, yeah, where, where uh, I think it's Styles and his buddy are trying to, you know, they're trying to, to use a fake idea to get a fake ID to get, uh, to get booze. And in the background, you can see the rainbow arch for the Rainbow Theater. So that uh -oh. is that at least lives on, but uh, but that's where we would more than more often than not see our movies. Oh wow! Now, did you get the big popcorn and like was your favorite like malted uh, caramels or M and M and peanuts? Like, did you guys? Because there's a lot of you there. Did you guys have your favorite snacks at the movies? <laughs> I I think it was almost always sharing a popcorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They have the best popcorn and like please put butter on it. I don't care if it's lard, just put oh, it on it. Heavy there. on the butter, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And then you realize like later it's like, <laughs> you know, that's lard butter. And like, I don't care, it's delicious. <laughs> and it's yeah. needed at a movie. <laughs> No, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, uh, let me just see. Like, um, we want to get into a little bit about directing. Yeah, we have time. Like, who's your favorite? One of your favorite directors? Um, I would still have to say. Spielberg easily, easily. Uh, you know, there are some of his movies that I like more than others, but uh, but I would still have to say he's my favorite. And again, because of that that influence that he had on my life, you know, it, it's it's in a way like his movies are like the soundtrack of my life. Like I I can I can identify you know just based on on timeline and his movies, kind of where I was in life and what I was doing. So. Yeah, I would still have to say him. Yeah, and and I, and I think beyond that, it's it's really all of the different directors that I've had the the pleasure to work with, you know, and some that I haven't had the pleasure to work with. You know, the the really great thing, what I mean by that is that there are some directors that 
I would probably never want to work with again, <laughs> but they are all a learning experience. I mean, for me now as a director, I've, I've, it's given me the opportunity to take every one of those experiences and, you know, become the director that, uh, that I want to be the type of director that, that the people that work with me, you know, years, hopefully later can say that they enjoyed the, uh, the experience, you know, they had fun. Yeah. And do you have a favorite, um, a film shot, a moving scene from a movie that, uh, that is one of your favorites? Yeah, I think in movie we did, we actually, we just talked about it right now. It's that moment with E.T. and Elliot in the bedroom. You know, it's, it's the, you're going to say, it's God, John Williams. What a genius. You know, it's, it's the subtlety, the, the, just the soft, quiet quality of that score in that moment. You know, and then, and again, keeping everything low and, and you could, you could kind of tell really that, that Spielberg just let, you know, uh, let them do what they wanted to do. Let the kids kind of, you know, own the character. And that to me was really, really great. It's, it's still, still holds true. I mean, and, but there are lots of other things that, that, that like, I really love Coen Brothers movies. Um, I believe one of them is the man that wasn't there and, uh, I think their shot choices are amazing. And it's the other thing to me, it's just the cinematography of all of, of, all of it. Uh, Guillermo del Toro is another one who I absolutely just, just love watching everything that he does, you know, from the shape of water to, uh, to Pan's Labyrinth, obviously. Oh, Pan's um, Labyrinth. Oh my yeah. gosh. My goodness sakes. Beautiful. Ah, oh, when, yeah. yeah, that's a good one. And he doesn't, he doesn't mask the violence, which I think is, is also so commendable. It's, it's, his stories are still very much a fairy tale, but, but can go really dark, which, which, which I really love. Oh, yes. It's incredible. And so, um, and as, um, we're, we're going to probably, um, be wrapping up part one and we're, we're going to ask everyone to come back to part two, because we want to get to like your directing, your storyboards, my little pony, uh, the cat in the hat. We just have so much more stuff to go, but, um, uh, just like when learning to direct, like going from, uh, you, you, did you always do storyboarding? Like that was when you said you did the um thing, was that how you started with storyboarding and then you went? No, to oh, actually. I started as a traditional animator. I started as a cleanup artist and made my way up to assistant animator, key assistant animator. And then the, uh, and then the rug got pulled out from under me and a lot of other people over at Disney when they switched from 2d to CG oh. from traditional to CG. And I was lost. I didn't know what to do. They had some classes in Maya that they had a couple nights a week. I was coming home to my wife with a headache every night that I had a class. So my brain just didn't work that way. It was far more math based. I wasn't drawing anymore. I didn't have a pencil in my hand. It didn't feel natural. And I know that for some people it clicks and it works and God bless them because they can produce amazing work, but it, it forced me to, uh, to reevaluate what I was going to do with my career. And that's when I switched to storyboarding. Oh. I got lucky. Yeah, so I got lucky. And that opened up a whole other world for me. It, 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 for me, it was, it was exactly what I needed and what I wanted to do for the rest of my career was focus on story and then eventually work my way into directing. That's incredible how like that, like that door closed and that obstacle uh, led you into a new path that was a better path and a more beautiful path that led you to be the director that you are today. That is amazing. That is really amazing. Um, so we're going to end part one with Art Hernandez, and we're going to ask everyone to come on back to part two with Arturo Art Hernandez, who is directing The Cat in the Hat and co-producer on the film My Little Pony, A New Generation. And, and we have so much more to talk about how, his first, how he worked on his first feature film, right? Cats, Don't yeah. Dance to now directing Cat in the Hat. Incredible. So come on back to everyone for part two. Thank you for listening. Um, and we'll just come on back. We're going to be on um, part two.